Uh, thank you very much, Nick, and thank you for the introduction, and thank you very much for asking me to come and talk today. Um, I'm going to talk really about the... I've been asked to talk about the Orgis perspective on um, anti-reflux surgery and services for reflux disease generally. Um, the I think there's no doubt that Orgis... The, the, the structure of Orgis, the... The aims of Orgis have changed fundamentally in the last couple of years with a much greater emphasis on benign surgery and emergency surgery. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of our views and plans for how we can uh, develop standards, monitor what's going on in, in the treatment of reflux disease. Um, periodically over the years, Orgis has produced guidelines on the management of reflux disease. Uh, 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 the last update was... Uh, four and a half years ago. We're currently, um, and over the next few months, we'll be updating these. Um, and these were, we were asked to do this in combination with the Royal College of Surgeons. And, and, and again, if you're interested, you can look at them. You may well know them anyway. They're fairly basic guidelines. There was issues, uh, recommendations about what should happen in primary care, what should happen in secondary care, indications for surgery, what investigations you should do, the types of surgery, endoscopic treatment. Uh, there's recommendations on a quality dashboard, looking at short, medium, long-term complications and side effects, and uh, an attempt to set out some outcome measures at a relatively basic level, looking at the GERD-Q questionnaire, length of stay, laparoscopic rate, reoperation rate, readmission rate, and the beginnings of some recommendations about volume activity. Um, you'll be familiar, many with your soft with the BSG guidelines on manometry and reflux monitoring. And, and the, the, the main emphasis in those guidelines about surgery is really the importance of doing manometry. And it doesn't really say much else other than that. And I think latterly, probably the the, 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 the most comprehensive guidelines are the ICRIS guidelines, which came out a year ago and, and are pretty good and, and, and are very comprehensive in recommending um, selection of patients for this surgery. Um, we know that anti-reflux surgery works, it's not perfect, and you'll all be very familiar with the LOTUS and the Nordic studies showing um, at least equivalence with best medical therapy bearing in mind, of course, that these were all comers, whereas virtually all surgical series have a, about 70% of them are medical failures. Um, but we know that it's not perfect. And I think most of us would quote 85 to 90% success rate for fund application. We'll hear the other intervention results later. Um, but we know that, that you know, long-term follow-up, a lot of them have dysphagia, a lot of them have bloating and flatulence, and about 10% do end up needing revisional surgery at some stage and a high proportion in, in, in different series suggest they need to be on long-term PPIs as well. So, um, but we don't really know what's going on in the country, in the real world. And, and the only way to find out about the activity in the UK is looking at HES data, the hospital episode statistics. And this was a, a paper just published a few months ago by Shiraz Markar, who many of you will know, looking at um, the, 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 the prevalence of, of, of anti-reflux surgery, particularly the re-intervention by surgery for reflux disease in England. And, and this is, I think most people would agree that HES data is the best way of looking at activity. It's not, it's not as accurate as we would like, but it is improving its accuracy. And I, for one, think this is going to be the way forward in, in, in the long term for monitoring activity of all sorts of surgical um, procedures. This was linked to the clinical practice research database, a, 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 a primary care database to look at medication with PPI so we could try and work out, so they could try and work out how many people were on PPIs. And it showed that in that 13 year period from 2000 to 2012, there were 22,377 um, laparoscopic procedure or procedures for anti-reflux disease using surgery. This is clearly will be excluding most of the private work done in private hospitals, about 1,750 per year. Of those 3.6% had uh, revisional surgery over an average follow-up of five and a half years. Um, and linking to the CPRD, it showed that, that getting on for 60% of patients were on PPIs in that follow-up period. 
uh, the various risk factors for redo surgery are detailed there. And it's, it, it, it's really interesting, I think, that it does demonstrate that hospital volume is linked to outcome for um, anti-reflux surgery. I think it's probably something we've all recognised, but it's interesting to see that actually demonstrated. Uh, and just to emphasise that again, we know the volume outcome relationship for, for many other aspects of surgery. This I'm just demonstrating here that has been established for esophageal cancer surgery. And of course, this has led to a huge centralisation over the last 20 years of esophagogastric cancer surgery. We've seen the same for liver surgery as well. Um, and this volume outcome relationship is quite is, is, is very stark from the HES data that I've just demonstrated. Now, we may know some of that, but there's a huge amount we don't know about laparoscopic anti-reflux or lap interventions for reflux disease in the UK. We don't really know who's doing it. We don't know who should be doing it. We don't know what we should be doing. What standards should we be setting? How many is each surgeon doing? How many should each surgeon be doing? Um, what outcomes should we be measuring and what are the results of surgery in the UK? And these are just some questions I thought off the cuff last night. And, and I'm sure you can think of a similar number of questions that we should be asking as well. And we don't really know the answer to any of this. Um, and we, I, I think we in all just feel that we, 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 we were very keen to try and provide some answers for that. Um, for years, we, we've published our provision of services for upper GI surgeon. We updated them and I led on that four years ago. We're again going to update them again in the next year. And we developed a, a description of standards and, and, and suggested volumes of activity for OG disease, both benign and cancer, HBB for benign and cancer, with a, with a strong emphasis on MDT working, the, the, the recommended unit infrastructure and support services and minimum standards of outcomes and volume of activity. And it's designed as guidance for surgeons, commissioners, and patient representatives. And I'll just pick out a couple of the things we've said about benign surgery. And, and the, the numbers were deliberately set very low. This was five, six years ago when we developed these. We, we didn't want to piss off too many people, so we have deliberately set the numbers low. And I'm sure many of you will think these numbers are too low, um, but we are gonna be revising these and I'm in, in no doubt that these numbers will increase in time. So we've recommended that a minimum of two surgeons carry out these operations in each unit. Um, we've recommended that the, the minimum volume of activity for individual surgeons should be five per year. I, I think you'll all be surprised by that. I certainly wanted to have it slightly higher than that at 10, but um, I think the general consensus is we should start low but build that number up over, over years. And we recommended that revisional surgery for reflux disease, high to or achalasia should be carried out in tier three specialist centers with a minimum of two surgeons experience in complex hiatal surgery. I, I'm not convinced that's correct. I don't think it necessarily does have to be done in resectional centers, but it does need to be done in centers where they do a lot of them, but there's no reason why that couldn't be a non-resectional center. Um, We've recommended the laparoscopic rate for laparoscopic anti-reflux surgery should be 95%. The readmission rate, less than 5% for within two days and less than 10% for in 30 days. And that there should be an 80%, a greater than 80% satisfaction rate from the GERD-Q questionnaire. Um, so that was a starting point. And I think we are, have got very clear plans for how we move forward. We're going to revise our guidelines. We're going to revise our provision of standard, provision of services standards. Um, but I think we have a sort of a three pronged approach to really developing a much more detailed assessment um, uh, of, anti, of what's going on in the UK and developing minimum standards and outcomes. And ultimately, hopefully having a really comprehensive database or registry where which everyone enters data into. And it's based around the, the HES data the Arrow study, which uh, Tim Underwood and I know Shamin's with us, Shamin's been heavily involved with, and a proposal for, call it what you like, but the current name is a National Hiatal Surgery Registry. Um, now, NHS England are developing this, but but the the, the preliminary development was, was this uh, a database called SWORD, which Ian Beckingham from Nottingham has developed, and many of you will be familiar with it. I think it's terrific. 
Um, it's a surgical workload outcomes audit database, which is an internet based web tool which provides data on activity, so numbers of procedures, and short term outcomes such as readmission or reoperation rate for most general surgical procedures. And, and it's looked, Ian set it up to look at upper GI, benign, and cancer, hernias lower GI, excluding IBD surgery, and, and recently endocrine surgery as well. Now, it, it's interesting, and, it should, and, and this, we have to pay for this. So, Orgis and ALS and ACP all pay for this, and I think the Endocrine Society as well. And it's been developed by, by, by an independent company. It's interesting, NHS England are developing the same, and, and I've met up with them, and, and some of you may also have seen what they're developing. It's, it's identical to this. Uh, it's all gone a bit quiet in the last year or two, probably for reasons we understand, but it may well be this becomes a tool that's freely available through NHS England for all of us. I'm just going to show a few screenshots for what you can get out of this. So this is, um, I I've got a, if you can see there, so there's various different pathway groups. This is upper GI benign. I've chosen reflux surgery. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the total number in this study period, which is, 1st of April 2019 to end of March 2020, so very current. 1,563 recorded on HES, um, all of them elective, the vast majority laparoscopic, and the sex distribution and the age distribution is seen. Um, this graph shows across the country the activity, uh, the volume of operations being done per trust um, in that main graph, and you can see the highest is Portsmouth with 141 laparoscopic operations for reflux disease in that year going down to some extremely small volume and the median activity i think was is about 20 in there not very not not that many really but and in the bottom part of it so and the, the next graph down shows that the monthly activity in the bottom you can look at individual surgeons and every surgeon who ha has their own uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, identifying number you can look per trust i've just happened to highlight what Oxford does, and this shows, I think we did 57 in that year. Um, and again, it, it's you'll all be familiar with some of the inaccuracies of HES data, particularly in terms of consultant allocation to operations. We don't have seven people doing anti-reflux surgery in Oxford. Um, some of these are registrars. Um, I think one of the HPB surgeons is supposedly meant to have done them, but we know he hasn't. So there are inaccuracies, but it gives an overall pattern. You can get information about length of stay, and this shows the median length of stay is about just over two days, highest being 14.8. But of course, that's where they do anti-reflux surgery on lung transplant patients, so perhaps not surprisingly. But there are increasing numbers of people doing it as day cases. And when we look at that, you can see the median for most Trust is only about 12% of patients have been done as day cases, but there are some people who are doing 60, 70% of their cases as day cases. And when you look at reoperation rates, so the, the numbers of those patients having reoperations within 30 days, um, the median is about 2%, but some outliers here up to 15%, and that indicates there may be a problem there. Readmissions over 30 days, or you can calibrate this for over seven days or over two days. And again, it shows a spread. The median is about 10% of patients are being readmitted, but some as high as 30%, again, indicating a potential problem. And if you want to, you can look at mortality as well. Um, it's, mortality is very rare in this disease, in, in this surgery, but of course, there are sporadic cases of that. And finally, um, for those surgeons, amongst us who are doing these interventions, you can get an, an, a, 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 a summary of your whole activity for that year and, and previous years for your appraisal. So it's a big advantage in, in getting data for your appraisal. Now, I'm gonna mention a bit about the ARROW study. Um, again, this has been set up, uh, led by Tim Underwood, but shamine has been heavily involved and Marianne Holloman also have been the, the main uh, uh, instigator of this. It's a, it, ARROW stands for Audit and Review of Anti-Reflux Operations and Workup, and it's a multi-centre prospective cohort study to investigate the current management of patients undergoing anti-reflux surgery in the UK. Um, it's been conducted at centres across the UK using a secure online web platform. There are two parts, a registration questionnaire, which has, I think, just about closed. Shamin will 
let us know about that or imminent. And then part two, which hasn't started, it's been delayed by COVID, a prospect of multi-centre audit of anti-reflux surgery over 12 months. And I'll just show some of the excerpts from the, the survey that has almost finished. And these are individual surgeons for the trust have been asked to do. Um, and you can, you, you know, what your job role is, your primary practice, how many do you do a year, what, are, what investigations, this is a spot survey of your current practice. What investigations would you consider compulsory for anti-reflux surgery? What operations do you do in the NHS in private? And I would stress it's looking at not just fund applications, it's looking at links, strata, esofix, bypass when it's a when the primary aim is 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 the treatment of reflux. Um, what type of surgery do you do? Um, what do you do as day case? What don't you do as day case? Um, and then a variety of things about what you do during the surgery. Do you divide the short gastrics? Do you repair the hiatus anterior or posterior or both, a collis, et cetera, et cetera. And you can read through these. Um, so it's a pretty comprehensive spot survey of, of current practice. And also various questions about your institution, how many in the whole place, how many surgeons do it? Is it a resectional centre, is it a bariatric centre, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you have a database? So this is, this is uh, 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 I think, closing imminently, and then the prospective study will start. Um, my understanding from talking to Tim yesterday was that the preliminary results show that, and perhaps not surprising, that we're all over the shop in the UK, that there's no real standardised practice. It, lots of people do different things. Um, and, and as I said, that's probably not surprising to everyone. So... Um, the part two is, 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 is hopefully starting soon, and maybe Shamin can tell us when. It's, as I said, it's looking at fund application, linked strata, esofix, and uh, bariatric surgery if reflux is the primary indication. It's looking at both NHS and private, and it's going to be looking at patient demographics, predominant symptoms, preoperative investigations, surgery indication, intraoperative details, and postoperative outcomes within the first 90 days. So just to, just to finish off and take any questions, uh, my view, I think our order's view is we really want to use this three-pronged approach. The HES database, the ARROW study to help us structure a proposed national database or registry for, for hiatal surgery. Um, and this will be really being run through Orgis, but particularly through the British Benign Upper Gastrointestinal Surgical Society, which Stuart Andrews and Torbay set up, that's now been incorporated into Orgis and will be helping to drive a lot of this um, as part of the uh, committee in Orgis that's going to drive it. And I'm hoping it's going to provide answers and recommendations to the questions we've asked already. So I'm going to stop there, Nick, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Nick, that's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. It's um... It's good to see that Algis is finally starting to think about benign disease and uh, moving away from all those endless talks about plucking lymph nodes from around <laughs> the, the, from, in, from, the, from the chest. Um, uh, the, there was a, a, a really interesting question from Simon Dexter, who, who said, well, this is um, all very interesting, but what about the private sector? And I think that's important because we know that there are um, the last well, the last data I saw was that there are as many operations undertaken in the private sector as there are in the entire um, NHS every year. So, what's what's some um, Algis's view with regard to how you're going to incorporate what's obviously is a very large and significant amount of data? Yeah, I mean, the, the, our view is is doesn't go much further than we need to collect it. I mean, now this is this is we we. we this is all in evolution at the moment. I mean, the HES data clearly isn't going to connect that. I think the the, the, the SOAR database uh, at the moment, uh, so we, I see that as, as a way of feeding in the activity into this registry and database, and we have to capture the private, da da the private uh, data as well. I, I, I haven't got a clear view how we'll do that, and we'll engage, I mean, we'll engage with people on this panel to try and work out the best way of capturing that data. But you're absolutely right, we have to get that. And and that and that's just as important. And and we we'll learn from what they've done with MBSR, of course, because they've collected all that stuff. So and that's a fantastic registry, which we really want to try and emulate. 
So we'll we'll learn from others. And can I just ask a, a, a sort of follow up question on, on that as well? Because of course the National Joint Registry, which all the orthopedic um, surgeons uh, have to effectively include all their data in of, of all uh, joint implants um, from wherever they practice, um, that is. Uh, publicly available. So that data, you can go and look at that data. It's, it's openly accessible to the public. Um, but of course, the, I don't think the SWORD database is, is it? I mean, it's uh, it's just available to individuals who put the data in. So what's the, or maybe there isn't one, but what would uh, the, the, the likely view of, of that transparency and agenda around transparency be? Well, there certainly is a view, Nick. Um, I mean, it should be absolutely transparent. I think the NHS England uh, equivalent of SWORD, which and I, they certainly had made a big inroads into that when I last spoke to them, but that was a year ago, and I don't know what's happening now. That certainly, in principle, would be would be open for public consumption. And and and, and I think you know, as you know, that the National Esophageal Gastric Cancer Database is, is open for public consumption, so you can look up your how good your surgeon is or how bad your surgeon is. So I think it absolutely should be available like that ultimately. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and that is the, the very clear vision of all of us in orders that we should be doing that.